Are we rolling? According to the camera. Well, good enough. You're rolling. Hey, it is so good to be here with you. Um, I think I'll just pray, because a little prayer never hurts. Our Father in heaven, we just um, invite you into our service. Um, we know that you're already here. Just we need to invite you because we need our eyes open to see you our ears open to hear you, and our hearts open to receive what you have for us. And so, I am going to pray, Father, whether it's through my rambling up here, or whether it's through some other means, that nobody leaves here today without getting a message from you. I pray that you will speak a right now word, a real word, something of help to each person. Father in heaven, we also lift up our pastor and his family. We love them. We are so glad they get to do a vacation once in a while. That is wonderful. We pray that they will be refreshed and renewed and encouraged in every way. And also we pray, Father, before I stop praying here, we just pray for those in this world who are hurting, especially <clears throat> people in Ukraine and Russia, your people who are facing uh, terrible circumstances. We call on you to bring justice, to bring mercy, to bring relief, to bring resolution, to bring what only you can bring. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> I tell you, you know, I like to have a message where it's like all one idea and all one thought, okay? But somehow that didn't come together this week. So I have four completely unrelated things to talk about. And uh, I, you know, I don't know, should I tell you this? I'm kind of afraid to tell you this, but I never practice this ahead of time. So I never have any idea whether it's going to go 10 minutes or an hour and a half. And so I'm always just kind of watching the clock, editing myself as, as we go. I promise, I promise it will not go an hour and a half. So my voice won't last that long. So, Okay, so first thing is I want to ask you a question. Okay? And you just think about it. You don't have to answer out loud unless you feel really compelled to. Uh, and that is, what do you like about your faith? And just think about that. Ponder that. What do you like about your faith? And um, I will tell you what I like about my faith. When I was 10 years old, we got these uh, Bible story books. I think they were put out by the Seventh-day Adventists. And years ago, many of you I'm sure don't remember this, they used to be in dentist offices. And then there'd be a little card, you know, where you could order your own. I think now dentists probably, that's too religious for them. But anyway, this is Arthur Maxwell. Arthur. Arthur Maxwell um, uh, wrote these. And I was reading in these Bible story books and I came across the story of Enoch, the man who walked with God. And um, Enoch walked with God for 300 years and then he somehow stepped off the edge of this earth into eternity. And as a 10-year-old boy, that captivated me. And I made it my ambition in my life that I want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that walks with God. That's what I want to do. That's who I want to be. And um, I, uh, uh, I don't claim to be any good at it. But 
I'm just overwhelmed that I get to do it. I mean, what a privilege. And so, what do I like about my faith? I like that I get to walk with God. And now think about it, you know? What could you offer me that's better than that, you know? I could win the lottery, that would be nice, you know? It's nice to have money. You can do a lot of fun things with money. You can do a lot of good things with money. But what is that compared to walking with God? If I had to make a choice, I'd much rather walk with God. You could give me, um, you could put me on that Elon Musk thing and send me to Mars, and I could be one of those colonists in Mars, and that'd be a neat adventure, wouldn't it? My wife is shaking her head. I kind of feel the same way, living underground. Nah, I don't want it. But anyway, what is that compared to walking with God? I mean, I'm walking with the person who can give me a tour of every single planet in the universe if he wants to. Uh, you can give me some kind of magic pill that would fix my teeth, that would fix my hearing so I could hear what my wife is saying to me that would fix my eyes so that I could see, that would turn this flabby, out-of-shape body into a lean, mean fighting machine, that uh, would even grow hair on the top of my head, and would allow me to live for a thousand years. And what is that compared to walking with God? I get to walk with God. I'll get to walk with God a thousand years, and then when that's over, I'll get to walk with God a thousand times a thousand years, and I'll just be getting started. So what do I like about my faith is I get to walk with God. One down, three to go. Okay, I have another question for you. Why do you believe what you believe? I mean, I think that's a question that we got to come back to every so often, right? Why do you believe what you believe? I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. Why do I believe what I believe? So, let me talk you through that. First of all, why do I believe in God? <clears throat> let me ask you, why do you believe in God? Well, I look at it this way. It's four choices, okay? The first choice is I could be an atheist. But now here's the problem with being an atheist. An atheist has what I call the purple flower problem, okay? Now what is the purple flower problem? The purple flower problem is the person who proclaims Absolutely, there are no purple flowers in the universe. And you ask, how do you know? And he says, it's easy. All I've ever seen is white flowers. Therefore, there are no purple flowers. Do you know where I'm going with this? How do you know that there is no God? Have you looked behind every atom in the universe to verify that there is no God. You know, I don't do this often, but once in a while I get into a conversation with somebody online that tells me they're an atheist, and you know, uh, we go back and forth for a while, and again, I don't seek this out, I don't do this a lot, but it's like invariably, uh, after a few minutes, after a week, after a month, they realize, oh no, I'm not an atheist, I'm an agnostic. Because proving that there is no God is a trillion times harder than proving that there is a God. So, I'm not an atheist, but you've got three other choices. You have agnostic version one. Agnostic version one says you can't know. Nobody can know whether there is a God or not. It's impossible to know. Okay, so I look at that option and I say, how do you know? I mean, have you examined the minds of every single person who has ever lived and ever will live? 
Have you lived for 100,000 years so that you know that there's no way to know that there is a God? How do you know? So that doesn't make sense to me, agnostic version one. But then there's agnostic version two, which says, I don't know. You know? I don't know if there's a God. Okay, well, that at least is, uh, is a little more honest. Okay? I don't know if there's a God or not. And um, I get that. I think there's a little more humility with that. There's a little more honesty with that. Um, and so I have to ask myself the question, so how do you decide if there is a God or if there isn't a God? Okay, how do you decide? Well, I look at uh, the court system, okay? In the court system, how is somebody found guilty? What needs to happen for somebody to be sentenced to 40 years in prison? They have to be found guilty beyond a, say the word, reasonable, reasonable doubt. Okay? I have unreasonable doubts. Unreasonable doubts about God. But I don't have any reasonable doubts. And let me walk you through why I don't. Okay? First of all, if you're going to say that there is no God, then you have the problem of nothing creating everything. And like, how does that work? Okay? And I know, I mean, I've done some reading, and I know that scientists try to get around this. And they try to say, well, quantum fluctuation created everything. Quantum fluctuation created the Big Bang, which created the universe. And my question is, who or what created quantum fluctuation? How did it get here? And then they try to weasel out of that by saying, but the universe has always been here. Well, that answers the question when, but it doesn't answer the question how. How did it get here? Another way of saying that is it doesn't remove the need for causation. It removes our understanding of causation. So you have that problem that nothing created everything, and that's a problem I can't get past, and so I believe in God. There had to be a first cause. And now some people kind of go back at this and they say, well, then who created God? And I say, wait a second, same rules don't apply here. Okay? The universe is natural. God is supernatural. He is, by definition, uncreated. He is, by definition, eternal. He is, by definition, first cause. So... I believe in God. But even if you could get past this whole issue of nothing creating everything, okay, even if there's some way, some squirrely way to get around that, then you have the problem of life. Okay, I have to look at my notes here. Smallest cell. Okay, now I brought a deck of cards to church, and I grew up in a church where playing cards were evil, so I am... If you feel that way, I, I am sorry for bringing this evil thing in the church, but I just wanted to bring it here so that I could illustrate something to you. It looks to me, yeah, it looks to me like they've already been shuffled, but I am going to, just in front of everybody, 52 playing cards, I'm shuffling. Okay, how many times has this deck of cards been in this exact order? The answer is none. How many times has any deck of cards in the world ever been in this exact order? The probability is overwhelmingly none. Here's why. 
If someone could rearrange a deck of cards every second of the universe's total existence, the universe would end before we got even a billionth of a way to finding a repeat. That's how many different arrangements there are of 52 cards. Five, two, two digit number, 52 cards. Okay, you got it? Now, smallest cell, smallest cell, smallest, tiniest, 300 million atoms. Okay, I don't care how many times lightning strikes the mud puddle of every mud puddle of every planet in the entire universe, the universe could be here a zillion times and you are not going to get the smallest cell. By comparison, human cell is a million times, the average human cell is a million times bigger and more complex than the smallest cell. Remember, 52 cards, 100 million atoms that have to be in the right place for the cell to work. It doesn't make sense. How do you get that without God? I don't see any way that you can. Okay, but even if you could get beyond nothing creating everything, and even if you could get beyond life beginning, then you have the problem of evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay? And now look, just before we all get our hackles up, if you want to believe in evolution, that's fine with me. If you don't want to believe in it, that's fine with me. I don't really care. But think about what it takes. Okay? I don't have a problem with viruses evolving. I don't have a problem with bacteria evolving. But when you start getting into sexual reproduction, here's what needs to happen. DNA has to remain reasonably stable for life to exist. Okay? I mean, if your DNA starts messing up, you get cancer and all kinds of nasty things happen to you. So DNA has to stay reasonably stable. Okay? But, and, and the vast majority, the vast majority of mutations to DNA are harmful. Okay? So, you, if, in order for evolution to take place, you have to have some kind of beneficial mutation take place in a male, and you have to have some kind of beneficial mutation take place in a female. The two, have, it, it has to happen at about the same time, which is off the charts impossible, they have to find each other, mate, produce offspring, offspring, and create a population before they get eaten. It's not going to happen without God. Sorry. You know? And look, that now has to happen not just once, but millions of times. I, there are a lot of people who turn to evolution as a way of booting God out of the universe, but it, it doesn't work. You can't do it. You can't boot God out of the universe with evolution. So anyway, I believe in God. I just think it's reasonable, beyond a reasonable doubt, for me to believe in God. And I, so all of that aside, the other reason I believe with God is I hang out with him. You know, I've experienced him. I've experienced all these crazy supernatural answers to prayer. And I told a lot of these, probably you know them, but in case you don't, I'll just tell us one or two stories again. Um, we lived in a house in Sun Prairie. It had a, an old house, had a basement, had a sump pump. A lot of the houses in Sun Prairie have sump pumps. Um, and anyway, uh, we were just um, self-employed and just, you know, barely hanging on in terms of being able to pay my bills, like every month I could pay my bills was another miracle, you know. And uh, our soap pump went out. And the washer and dryer, or the, well, the dryer, I guess it doesn't matter, but the washer is on the soap pump, and we need the soap pump. 
And so I'm praying to God and I'm saying, God, please fix our son, Papa. And he said to me, no, I'm not going to do it. You go buy a sump pump. How many of you have heard of this before? A few of you? Kim raises her hand. <laughs> well, so anyway, I said, fine, God, I'll go buy a sump pump. I'm thinking, how am I going to pay my bills, you know? But uh, I said, look, could you do me a favor and get me a sump pump for under $100? So I go down to Menards and I start looking at some pumps and here's one on the shelf for $99.99. <laughs> so there's my sub pump and I asked the lady in the department, is this any good? She says, yeah, I would use this in my house. And so I get it up to the register and it rings up for like $119. I said, wait a second, back on the shelf it said $99.99. Anyway, they looked at it and said, Oh yeah, somehow, we don't know how, but we made a mistake. We put the wrong price on it, but hey, we'll give it to you for $99.99. I forgot to ask God to make that tax included, but uh, <laughs> anyway, so I uh, buy this sump pump, I go home, I install the sump pump, and I'm walking upstairs, and I think, well, you know, I ought to check the mail. I get to the mail, I find this envelope, I open it up, and here's a check for $111, just totally out of the blue, totally I was not expecting it at all. I believe in God because I hang out with Him, and all of these crazy things happen, like not just once, but many, many times. Um, there were, this has happened so many times, I, I lost count. It would be the last day of the month. I didn't have any money at all, no money. And the rent was due, or the mortgage was due the next morning. And somehow, the next day, I had the money. Somehow, you know? Either I got a job, or I got an insurance settlement, or just, I got money just anonymously, or whatever, just somehow, it just happened over and over and over. So, I believe in God. I hang out with Him. And yes, as I said at the beginning, I have unreasonable doubts. But compared to the mountain of evidence, it's like the little tiny unreasonable doubts, they are not going to run my life. The mountain of evidence is going to run my life. And so, now, just the other thing about it is, okay, you believe in God, there are lots of gods, which one are you going to choose? Well, I am... Uh, I'm going to choose Jesus, and here's why. Because he rose from the dead. Okay? And that's not a fairy tale that happened. That's a historical event. And there are a whole bunch of reasons why you can verify that that was a historical event. But here's one of them. It's like there was so much opposition to Christianity at the very beginning that, the, that it would have been super, super easy for all these opponents of Christianity to just put a stop to it. All they had to do was produce the body of Jesus. But they couldn't, because he rose from the dead. And I figured, okay, he rose from the dead, he lived a good life, he healed people, he was kind to people. Uh, if he's the master of life and death, if he's the master of heaven and hell, um, and if he's a good guy, I'm going to follow him. You know, I'm not going to follow Buddha, who had some maybe neat ideas, or Confucius, who maybe had some neat ideas, or Krishna, who maybe had some neat ideas, or Muhammad, who maybe had some neat ideas. I'm going to follow the guy that rose from the dead, who's the master of life and death, heaven and hell, and is a good guy to boot. So. Anyway, so think about it, you know, these are my reasons, your reasons might be different, but why do you believe what you believe? This is good to come back to that once in a while. Okay, drink of water to me. Okay, two down, two to go. So, this one is most 
mostly directed at the over 50 crowd. Okay? Now, might apply to those of you who are younger, but it's mostly addressed to the over 50 crowd. Um, most of us have been there, you know? A son, a daughter, a sister, a brother, a spouse, a parent, a friend, someone we love, makes a horrible decision. You know, they mismanage their money, and they fall into an addiction, they climb into bed with somebody they shouldn't, they start a romance with the wrong person, they walk away from a loving spouse, they abandon their faith, or whatever. You know, they make a terrible decision. And you're thinking in your head, you're thinking, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, and they do it. And, um, you know, it's like they think their actions have zero impact on anyone but themselves. But you know very well that they don't. And you're left picking up the pieces. You know? So what do you do when people you love make decisions you hate? I mean, what do you do? I'll tell you, if you're like me, I'll tell you what I've felt like doing. Okay? I've felt like whacking them upside the head. I mean, I'll just be real with you. I've felt like whacking them upside the head. You know, I felt like grabbing them and shaking them and trying to knock some sense into them. It doesn't really work, does it? I mean, I mean, especially those of you who are over 50, you know it doesn't work. And so anyway, while I'm stewing over all of this, God comes along and he taps me on the shoulder and he says, I had this passage in 2 Timothy. You might want to read it. Emily, is there a Bible up there? Okay. Thank you. Who's got tell you a little, I guess I should get back on the camera here, let's tell you a little bit about the Bible. You know, if you open it about in half, you'll come to Psalms, maybe Proverbs, I came to Proverbs, but Psalms, Proverbs, it's about the middle of the Bible. And then you take that, the second half, and you open that about in half, and you should come to the end of the Old Testament or the beginning of the New Testament. I came to Micah, but that's pretty close to Matthew, just a few pages over, is Matthew. Okay, and then you take that and divide that in half, and you should come to the book of Acts, and then after Acts, you have all of these little books, you know, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and so on. Anyway, somewhere in the middle of that is 2nd Timothy. Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2. I actually have to print it printed out here, but I'll see if I can read this tiny print here. Um, <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26. <clears throat> Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, Dwight. Because you know they produce quarrels. <laughs> and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Um, thank you. So, there's a lot there. But let me focus in on that word repentance. What is repentance? When I mean, we usually think of repentance as this way, you know, I'm 
walking this way, and I do it without face, and then I'm walking this way. But that's technically not what repentance is. Repentance is a brand new perspective. God grants us repentance. He grants us a brand new perspective. And um, let me just illustrate that idea of perspective. I don't know how many of you were alive back in the late 60s, early 70s, but uh, we had uh, this crazy idea of style back then. <laughs> and I mean, it was weird. And anyway, about that time, my parents bought some dining room chairs, and they were like this vinyl, plastic, whatever. And there was just this gaudy design on it. And I was a kid at the time, I don't know, 11, 12, something like that, and uh, maybe 13. I wasn't paying too much attention to dining room chairs at that point in my life. Uh, but I glanced at it, and it had this abstract pattern, looked like some flowers, and you know. So that's what I sat in, and you know, every meal we sat in these chairs and sat next to these flowers. <laughs> and um, one day, I'm looking at these chairs, I'm looking at this design, and I realize for the first time that those aren't flowers. Those are cows. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in front of me all along. It was always there, but this was the first time I saw it. And that's what repentance is. We pray that God will grant us all repentance. We need it. We need to see what's right in front of us has been there all along. So anyway, where do we go with that? Um, let me break this into two, <clears throat> two steps. Okay? Um, the first step is fix yourself first. Okay? Um, so, sometimes, maybe God doesn't fix that person in your life <clears throat> who's made a horrible decision because he's using them to fix you. I'll give you an example. Someone in my life was wrestling with an addiction. And obviously, I can't tell you too much because I give away confidential information. But, and I did all the wrong things. All the wrong things. I got angry. I argued. I pleaded. I did damage to the relationship. It was a mess. And finally, God forced me to look at myself and see how my reaction, I'm reading my notes here because I thought this was pretty good, see how my reaction to this addiction was showing up some real issues in my own life. And so I needed to repent. I needed a new perspective from God. And there was this, this dramatic thing that happened. I wish I could tell you about it, but I don't think I can. But anyway, this dramatic thing happened, like in front of 300 people one day. It was just like, I was just broken. And I just realized for the first time, I guess what was there in front of me all along, that this person that I was so upset with, how precious they were, and how proud I was of them. I needed to repent. And then, after God granted me this repentance, then this addiction started to slowly lose its grip on this other person. So fix yourself first. I mean, you know, what are you feeling? 
Well, this person makes this horrible decision. What are you feeling? Are you feeling, are you angry? Are you feeling frightened, embarrassed, discouraged, exasperated? I gotta tell you, I've felt all of those things, okay? But you gotta take those feelings to God. And um, if those feelings could talk, what would they say? You gotta tell that to God. You just gotta spill your soul to God and let Him bring repentance. Let Him bring healing. Let Him bring the soothing truth that heals us inside. You know, God wants to mend the fractured pieces of our souls, but He can't do it if we don't give him access to it. So we've got to take all these mixed up, angry, frightened, broken feelings to God and let him bring healing. Okay. How do you tell if you're on the mend? You start seeing this other person through a different set of eyes. Um, you start seeing them as God sees them. You know, you find this new level of respect and compassion and love. Um, everybody does what they do for a reason, you know. And it's easy, well, it can be easy to be self-righteous, but we're messed up too. I mean, let's be real, you know. All of us are work in progress, every single one. We have our issues. And um, so God enables us to see the good. And um, most likely this person who's made this terrible decision, they still have something of value to teach you, to show you. So anyway, we all grow in different ways. One of us isn't better than the other. We all make mistakes. It's just part of the human condition. Okay, step two is trust God to work on them. I mean, do you have the power to change them? Any of you who are over 50 know very well you do not. And probably most of you under 50 know it too. You, you can't. You wish you could, but you can't. But I just want to say this, don't underestimate the power of God's work in our lives. It's very easy to overestimate the power of sin and to underestimate the power of God. Turn that around. Okay? God is able to do amazing things. Speak a blessing over them. The Bible says bless and do not curse. You know? Um, every day, nearly every day, I say a blessing over each member of my family. They don't hear it. They're not around to the item. Most of them don't even know what it is. But I say a blessing over everyone every single day. Because I am a son of God. And that means that God's DNA is in me. God spoke and the universe came into being. That means my words have some power. And so I speak a blessing over my family. And... Uh, God is not going to let those words fall to the ground. Pray for them. Say a prayer. And understand this, that when God gets a hold of them, their walk is going to look different than your walk. Okay? God did not create them in your image. He created them in his own image. And when we're created in the image of God, that means that every time the photocopier spits out another human being, they look completely different than the last one. Okay. Um, I need to add this disclaimer, just so we all know. Sometimes, some people are just toxic, and for our own safety and our own sanity, we need to set some boundaries, okay? We, we all know that, okay? So I'm not saying don't set boundaries. Sometimes you need to do that. But as much as possible, keep the door open. Give them a soft place to land. Don't be judgmental. You know, it's like if you, 
let's point it at me, okay? If I do something really, really stupid, then I realize, what was I thinking, okay? Do I want everybody around me to say, Dwight, that was really, really stupid, you know? Is that going to make it easier for me to come back? You know, no, of course not. And so, give people a soft place to land. Okay. Three down, one to go. And look, it's still before 11. We're doing good. Um, every sermon is supposed to have an application or a takeaway. And this isn't specifically an application or a takeaway for this sermon. This is an application or a takeaway for every sermon. Okay? It's very simple. Very simple. Invite. Jesus in. Okay? If you're going through, I'm going to read this, if you're going through a difficult time in your life, invite Jesus in. You know, what does that look like? God, right now, life doesn't feel good at all. But Jesus, I open the door to you. I don't want to go through this alone. Please be with me. Things are going great. Invite Jesus in. Jesus, I open the door to you. My life is great. I want you to know how grateful I am. I invite you here to share this beautiful time in my life with me. If you feel tempted to do wrong, invite Jesus in. It's a perfect time to invite Jesus in. Okay, Jesus, I'm really tempted to do X, but I know you want me to do Y. I need you here. I open the door to you. I invite you here to fix what's broken inside me. If life is just ho-hum, humdrum, okay, normal, nothing remarkable, invite Jesus in. Jesus, welcome to my life. It's just regular, but I want you to know that you're welcome here. Please be at home here with me. Please show me how to honor you. If you're angry at God, invite Jesus in. God, I am so angry with you right now. I don't know what to do. But I can't solve this problem at a distance. So Jesus, I invite you here to sit with me and help me figure out what to do. If you think God is completely irrelevant and not important in your life, invite Jesus in. Jesus, I don't see how you are relevant to my life. I don't think I need you, but I could be wrong. So invite, so I invite you in. I'm making room for you so you can show me what I need to know. If you're not sure God exists and you wonder whether Jesus really is the Son of God and if he really did rise from the dead, invite Jesus in. Jesus, I don't even know whether God exists or whether you are the Son of God, but if He does, and if you are, I want you to know that you're welcome here. I invite you in. Show me the truth, reveal yourself to me, and I will follow you. Anyway, invite Jesus in. Lord Jesus, we just invite you in. Invite you into the rest of the day. Lord, what a, what a privilege, what an honor it is to hang out with you. Thank you so much. I pray a blessing on every person who is hearing these, these words. I pray a blessing on every person inside this building. Let your grace be with them. In Jesus' name.